Hello, Internet and friends. Welcome to Adult Bedtime Stories. Especially my brand new subscribers, because there are just so many of you. <laughs> and the new subscribers to come, because there will be so many of you. <laughs> Please subscribe if you are not already. Ring the notification bell because I don't really have a schedule, but if you guys want to uh, tell me the best day and time that you think you would like to see my videos uploaded when you would watch them, let me know in the comments because I'm not opposed to uh, picking, you know, a schedule to upload like one time a week or twice if I feel like it. Also, if you could just be so kind to smash that thumbs up button so that the algorithm will deem my video worthy to pass on to a couple more people who can then smash the algorithm and pass the video to a couple more people so we can build our community yeah yeah okay so today we're starting the subtle art of not giving a and we're gonna check out the Subtle Art of Not Giving a F by Mark Manson. A common intuitive approach to living a good life. Over three million copies sold. Wow. Alright. Let's see. The first chapters. Huh. Chapter one. Don't try. <laughs> All right. Cool. 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 Yo. Chapter one. Don't try. Charles Bukowski was an alcoholic, a womanizer, a chronic gambler, a lout, a cheapskate, a deadbeat, and on his worst days, a poet. He's probably the last person on earth you would ever look to for life advice or expect to see in any sort of self-help book. Which is why he's the perfect place to start. Bukowski wanted to be a writer, but for decades his work was rejected by almost every magazine, newspaper, journal, agent, and publisher he submitted to. His work was horrible, they said. Crude, disgusting, depraved, and as the stacks of rejection slips piled up, the weight of his failures pushed him deep into an alcohol-fueled depression that would follow him for most of his life. Mikowski had a day job as a letter filer at a post office. He got paid shit money and spent most of it on booze. He gambled away the rest at the racetrack. At night, he would drink alone and sometimes hammer out poetry on his beat-up old typewriter. Often, he'd wake up on the floor having passed out the night before. Thirty years went by like this, most of it a meaningless blur of alcohol, drugs, gambling, and prostitutes. Then, when Bukowski was fifty after a lifetime of failure and self-loathing, an editor at a small independent publishing house took a strange interest in him. The editor couldn't offer Bukowski much money or much promise of sales, but he had a weird affection for the drunk loser, so he decided to take a chance on him. It was the first real shot Bukowski had ever gotten, and he realized probably the only one he would ever get. Bukowski wrote back to the editor, I have one or two choices, stay in the post office and go crazy, or stay out here and play at writer and starve. I have decided to starve. You go, Bukowski. Upon signing the contract, Bukowski wrote his first novel in three weeks. It was called simply Post Office. In the dedication, he wrote, Dedicated to Nobody. Bukowski would make it as a novelist and poet. He would go on and publish six novels and hundreds of poems, selling over two million copies of, of his books. His popularity defied everyone's expectations, particularly his own. Stories like Bukowski's are the bread and butter of our cultural narrative. Bukowski's life embodies the American dream. A man fights for what he wants, never gives up, and eventually achieves his wildest dreams. It's practically a movie waiting to happen. We all look at stories like Bukowski's and say, See? He never gave up. He never stopped trying. He always believed in himself. 
he persisted against all the odds and made something of himself. It is then strange that on Bukowski's tombstone, the epitaph reads, Don't try. See, despite the book sales and the fame, Bukowski was a loser. He knew it, and his success stemmed not from some determination to be a winner, but from the fact that he knew he was a loser, accepted it, and then wrote honestly about it. He never tried to be anything other than what he was. The genius in Bukowski's work was not in overcoming unbelievable odds or developing himself into a shining literary light. It was the opposite. It was his simple ability to be completely, unflinchingly honest with himself, especially the worst parts of himself, and to share his failings without hesitation or doubt. This is the real story of Bukowski's success. His comfort with himself as a failure, Bukowski didn't give a fuck about success. Even after his fame, he still showed up to poetry readings, hammered and verbally abused people in his audience. He still exposed himself in public and tried to sleep with every woman he could find. Fame and success didn't make him a better person. Nor was it by becoming a better person that he became famous and successful. Self-improvement and success often occur together. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're the same thing. Our culture today is obsessively focused on unrealistically positive expectations. Be happier, be healthier, be the best, better than the rest. Be smarter, faster, richer, sexier. More popular, more productive, more envied, and more admired. Be perfect and amazing. And crap out of 12 carat gold nuggets. And crap out 12 carat gold nuggets before breakfast each morning while kissing your selfie-ready spouse and two and a half kids goodbye. Then fly your helicopter to your wonderfully fulfilling job where you spend your days doing incredibly meaningful work that's likely to save the planet one day. But when you stop and really think about it, conventional life advice, all the positive and happy self-help stuff we hear all the time, is actually fixating on what you lack. It lasers in on what you perceive your personal shortcomings and failures to already be, and then emphasizes them for you. You learn about the best ways to make money because you feel you don't have enough money already. You stand in front of the mirror and repeat affirmations saying that you're beautiful because you feel as though you're not beautiful already. You follow dating and relationship advice because you feel that you're unlovable already. You try goofy visualization experience ex the, 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 visualization exercises about being more successful because you feel as though you aren't successful enough already. Ironically, this fixation on the positive, on what's better, what's superior, only serves to remind us over and over again of what we are not, of what we lack, of what we should have been but failed to be. After all, no truly happy person feels the need to stand in front of a mirror and recite that she's happy. She just is. There's a saying in Texas, the smallest dog barks the loudest. A confident man doesn't feel a need to prove that he's confident. A rich woman doesn't feel a need to conceive anybody, feel a need to convince anybody that she's rich. Either you are or you're not. And if you're dreaming of something all the time, then you're reinforcing the same unconscious reality over and over, that you are not that. Everyone in their TV commercial wants you to believe that the key to a good life is a nicer job or a more rugged car or a prettier girlfriend, or a hot tub with an inflatable pool for the kids. The world is constantly telling you that the path to a better life is more, more, more. Buy more, own more, make more, fuck more, be more. You are constantly bombarded with messages to give a fuck about everything. All the time. Give a fuck about a new TV. Give a fuck about having a better vacation than your co-workers. Give a fuck about buying that new lawn ornament. Give a fuck about having the right kind of selfie stick. Why? My guess? Because giving a fuck about more stuff is good for business. And while there's nothing wrong with good business, the problem is that giving too many fucks is bad for your mental health. It causes you to become overly attached to the superficial and fake, to dedicate your life to chasing a mirage of happiness and satisfaction. 
The key to a good life is not giving a fuck about more. It's giving a fuck about less, giving a fuck about only what is true and immediate and important. The feedback loop from hell. There's an insidious quirk to your brain that, if you let it, can drive you absolutely batty. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Get anxious about confronting somebody in your life. That anxiety cripples you and you start wondering why you're so anxious. Now you're becoming anxious about being anxious. Oh no. Doubly anxious. Now you're anxious about your anxiety, which is causing more anxiety. Quick, where's the whiskey? Or let's say you have an anger problem. You get pissed off at the stupidest, most insane stuff, and you have no idea why. And the fact that you get pissed off so easily starts to piss you off even more. And then, in your petty rage, you realize that being angry all the time makes you a shallow and mean person, and you hate this. You hate it so much that you get angry at yourself. Now look at you. You're angry at yourself, getting angry about being angry. Fuck you all. Here, have a fist. Or you're so worried about doing the right thing all the time that you become worried about how much you're worrying. Or you feel so guilty for every mistake you make that you begin to feel guilty about how guilty you're feeling. Or you get sad and alone so often that it makes you feel even more sad and alone just thinking about it. Welcome to the feedback loop from hell. Chances are you've engaged in it more than a few times. Maybe you're engaging in it right now. God, I do the feedback loop all the time. I'm such a loser for doing it. I should stop. Oh my God, I feel like such a loser for calling myself a loser. I should stop calling myself a loser. Ah, fuck, I'm doing it again. See, I'm a loser. Ark. Calm down, amigo. Believe it or not, this is a part of the beauty of being a human. Very few animals on Earth have the ability to think cognate thoughts to begin with, but we humans have the luxury of being able to have thoughts about our thoughts. So... I can think about watching Miley Cyrus videos on YouTube and then immediately think about what a sicko I am for wanting to watch Miley Cyrus videos on YouTube. Ah, the miracle of consciousness. Now here's the problem. Our society today, through the wonders of consumer culture and hey look at my life is cooler than yours, social media, has bred a whole generation of people who believe that having these negative experiences, anxiety, fear, guilt, ETC, is totally not okay. I mean, if you look at your Facebook feed, everybody there is having a fucking grand old time. Look, eight people got married this week, and some 16-year-old on TV got a Ferrari for her birthday. And another kid just made $2 billion inventing an app that automatically delivers you more toilet paper when you run out. Meanwhile, you're stuck at home flossing your cat, and you can't help but think your life sucks even more than you thought. The feedback loop from hell has become a borderline epidemic, making many of us overly stressed, overly neurotic, and overly self-loathing. Back in Grandpa's day, he would feel like shit and think to himself, Gee whiz, I sure do feel like a cow turd today. But hey, I guess that's just life. Back to shoveling hay. But now... Now, if you feel like shit for even five minutes, you're bombarded with 350 images of people totally happy and having amazing fucking lives. And it's impossible to not feel like there's something wrong with you. It's this last part that gets us into trouble. We feel bad about feeling bad. We feel guilty for feeling guilty. We feel angry about getting angry. We get anxious about feeling anxious. What is wrong with me? This is why not giving a fuck is so key. This is why it's going to save the world. And it's going to save it by accepting that the world is totally fucked. And that's alright, because it's always been that way and always will be. By not giving a fuck that you feel bad, you short-circuit the feedback loop from hell and say to yourself, I feel like shit, but who gives a fuck? And then, as if sprinkled by magic fuck-giving fairy dust, you stop hating yourself for feeling so bad. George Orwell said that to see what's in front of one's nose requires a constant struggle. Well, the solution to our stress and anxiety is right there in front of our noses. And we're too busy watching porn and advertisements for ad machines that don't work, wondering why we're not banging a hot blonde with a rockin' six-pack to notice. We joke online about first-world problems, but we really have become victims of our own success. Stress-related health issues, anxiety disorders, and cases of depression have skyrocketed over the past 30 years, despite the fact that everyone has a flat-screen TV and can have their groceries delivered. Our crisis is no longer material. 
existential. It's spiritual. We have so much fucking stuff and so many opportunities that we don't even know what to give a fuck about anymore. Because there's an infinite amount of things we can now see or know. There are also an infinite number of ways we can discover that we don't measure up, that we're not good enough, that things aren't as great as they could be. And this rips us apart inside. Because here's the thing that's wrong with all of the how to be happy shit that's been shared 8 million times on Facebook in the past few years. Here's what nobody realizes about all this crap. The desire for more positive experience is itself a negative experience. And paradoxically, the acceptance of one's negative experience is itself a positive experience. This is a total mind fuck. so I'll give you a minute to unpretzel your brain and maybe read that again. Wanting positive experience is a negative experience. Accepting negative experience is a positive experience. It's what the philosopher Alan Watts used to refer to as the backwards law. The idea that the more you pursue feeling better all the time, the less satisfied you become as pursuing something only reinforces the fact that you lack it in the first place. The more you desperately want to be rich, the more poor and unworthy you feel, regardless of how much money you actually make. The more you desperately want to be sexy and desire, the uglier you come to see yourself, regardless of your actual physical appearance. The more you desperately want to be happy and loved, the lonelier and more afraid you become, regardless of those who surround you. The more you want to be spiritually enlightened, the more self-centered and shallow you become in trying to get there. It's like this one time I tripped on acid and it felt like the more I walked toward a house, the farther away the house got from me. And yes, I just used my LSD hallucinations to make a philosophical point about happiness. No fucks given. As the existential philosopher Albert Camus said, and I'm pretty sure he was on LSD at the time, you will never be happy if you continue to search for what happiness consists of. You will never live if you are looking for the meaning of life. Or, put more simply, don't try. Now, I know what you're saying. Mark, this is making my nipples all hard, but what about the Camaro I've been saving up for? What about the beach body I've been starving myself for? After all, I paid a lot of money for that ab machine. What about the big house on the lake I've been dreaming of? If I stop giving a fuck about those things, well then I'll never achieve anything. I don't want that to happen, do I? So glad you asked. Ever notice that sometimes when you care less about something, you do better at it? Notice how it's often the person who is the least invested in the success of something that actually ends up achieving it? Notice how sometimes when you stop giving a fuck, everything seems to fall into place? What's with that? That's... What's interesting about the backwards law is that it's called backwards for a reason. Not giving a fuck works in reverse. If pursuing the positive is a negative, then pursuing the negative generates the positive. The pain you pursue in the gym results in better all-around health and energy. The failures in business are what lead to a better understanding of what's necessary to be successful. Being open with your insecurities, paradoxically, makes you more confident and charismatic around others. The pain of honest confrontation is what generates the greatest trust and respect in your relationships. Suffering through your fears and anxieties is what allows you to build courage and perseverance. Seriously, I could keep going, but you get the point. Everything worthwhile in life is won through surmounting the associated negative experience. Any attempt to escape the negative, to avoid it or squash it or silence it, only backfires. The avoidance of suffering is a form of suffering. The failure, hiding what is shameful, is itself a form of shame. Pain is an inextricable thread in the fabric of life, and to tear it out is not only possible, but destructive. Attempting to tear it out unravels everything else with it. To try to avoid pain is to give too many fucks about pain. In contrast, if you're able to not give a fuck about the pain, you become unstoppable. In my life, I have given a fuck about many things. I've also not given a fuck about many things. And like the road not taken, it was the fucks not given that made all the difference. Chances are you know somebody in your life who at one time or another did not give a fuck. 
and then went on to accomplish amazing feats. Perhaps there was a time in your own life when you simply did not give a fuck and excelled to some extraordinary height. For myself, quitting my day job in finance after only six weeks to start an internet business ranks pretty high up there in my own didn't give a fuck hall of fame. Same with deciding to sell most of my possessions and move to South Africa. Fucks given? None. Just went and did it. These moments of non-fuckery are the moments that most define our lives. The major switch in careers, the spontaneous choice to drop out of college and join a rock band, the decision to finally dump that deadbeat boyfriend whom you caught wearing your pantyhose a few too many times, to not give a fuck is to stare down life's most terrifying and difficult challenges and still take action. While not giving a fuck, many seem simple on the surface. It's a whole new bag of burritos under the hood. I don't even know what that sentence means, but I don't give a fuck. A bag of burritos sounds awesome, so let's just go with it. That's so weird because my dad literally just made up the phrase a bag of donuts the other day. I mean, unless he didn't make that up, but he said he did. And I believed him, so I never heard it. <laughs> um, Most of us struggle throughout our lives by giving too many fucks in situations where fucks do not deserve to be given. We give too many fucks about the rude gas station attendant who gave us our change in nickels. We give too many fucks when a show we liked was canceled on TV. We give too many fucks when our coworkers don't bother asking us about our awesome weekend. Meanwhile, our credit cards are maxed out, our dog hates us, and Junior is snorting meth in the bathroom. Yet we're getting pissed off about nickels and everybody loves Raymond. That escalated quickly. Look, this is how it works. You're going to die one day. I know it's kind of obvious, but I just want to remind you in case you'd forgotten. You and everyone you know are going to be dead soon, and in the short amount of time between here and there, you have a limited amount of fucks to give. Very few, in fact. And if you go around giving a fuck about everything and everyone without conscious thought or choice, well, then you're going to get fucked. I literally just gave someone on TikTok the advice that they shouldn't care what people think, because someday they're going to be dead, and so is everybody they know, so it really doesn't matter. And I feel like that's pretty much what was just said here. Paraphrasing, huh? There's a subtle art to not giving a fuck, and though the concept may sound ridiculous, and I may sound like an asshole, what I'm talking about here is essentially learning how to focus and prioritize your thoughts effectively. How to pick and choose what matters to you and what does not matter to you based on finely honed personal values. This is incredibly difficult. It takes a lifetime of practice and discipline to achieve, and you will regularly fail. But it is perhaps the most worthy struggle one can undertake in one's life. It is perhaps the only struggle in one's life. Because when you give too many fucks, when you give a fuck about everyone and everything, you will feel that... You're perpetually entitled to be comfortable and happy at all times. That everything is supposed to be just exactly the fucking way you want it to be. This is a sickness, and it will eat you alive. You will see every adversity as an injustice, every challenge as a failure, every inconvenience as a personal slight, every disagreement as a betrayal. You will be confined to your own petty skull-sized hell, burning with entitlement and bluster, running circles around your very own personal feedback loop from hell in constant motion yet arriving nowhere the subtle art of not giving a fuck when people when most people envision giving no fucks whatsoever they imagine a kind of serene indifference to everything a calm that weathers all storms they imagine and aspire to be a person who is shaken by nothing and caves into no one there's a name for a person who finds no emotion or meaning in anything. A psychopath. Why you would want to emulate a psychopath? I have no fucking clue. So what does not giving a fuck mean? Let's look at three subtleties that should help clarify the matter. Subtlety number one. Not giving a fuck does not mean being indifferent. It means being comfortable with being different. Let's be clear. There's absolutely nothing admirable or confident about indifference. People who are indifferent are lame and scared. 
They're couch potatoes and internet trolls. In fact, indifferent people often attempt to be indifferent because in reality they give way too many fucks. They give a fuck about what everyone thinks of their hair, so they never bother washing or combing it. They give a fuck about what everyone thinks of their ideas, so they hide behind sarcasm and self-righteous snark. They're afraid to let anyone get close to them, so they imagine themselves as some special unique snowflake who has problems that nobody else would ever understand. Indifferent people are afraid of the world and the repercussions of their own choices. That's why they don't make any meaningful choices. They hide in a gray, emotionless pit of their own making, self-absorbed and self-pitying, perpetually distracting themselves from this unfortunate thing, demanding their time and energy called life. Because here's the sneaky truth about life. There's no such thing as not giving a fuck. You must give a fuck about something. It's part of our biology to always care about something, and therefore to always give a fuck. The question then is, what do we give a fuck about? What are we choosing to give a fuck about? And how can we not give a fuck about what ultimately does not matter? My mother was recently screwed out of a large chunk of money by a close friend of hers. Had I been indifferent, I would have shrugged my shoulders, sipped my mocha, and downloaded another season of The Wire. Sorry, Mom. But instead, I was indignant. I was pissed off. I said, no, screw that, Mom. We're going to lawyer the fuck up and go after this asshole. Why? Because I don't give a fuck, and I will ruin this guy's life if I have to. This illustrates the first subtlety of not giving a fuck. When we say, damn, watch out, Mark Manson just don't give a fuck, we don't mean that Mark Manson doesn't care about anything. On the contrary, we mean that Mark Manson doesn't care about adversity in the face of his goals. He doesn't care about pissing some people off to do what he feels is right or important or noble. We mean that Mark Manson is the type of guy who would write about himself in third person just because he thought it was the right thing to do. He just doesn't give a fuck. This is what is so admirable. No, not me, dumbass. The overcoming adversary stuff. The willingness to be different, an outcast, a pariah, all for the sake of one's own values. The willingness to share failure, the willingness to stare failure in the face and show your middle finger back at it. The people who don't give a fuck about adversary or failure or embarrassing themselves or shitting the bed a few times. The people who just laugh and then do what they believe in anyway because they know it's right. They know it's more important than they are. More important than their own feelings and their own pride and their own ego. They say, fuck it. Not to everything in life, but rather to everything unimportant in life. They reserve their fucks for what truly matters. Friends, family, purpose, burritos, and an occasional lawsuit or two. And because of that, because they reserve their fucks for only the big things that matter, people give a fuck about them in return. Because here's another sneaky little truth about life. You can't be an important and life-changing presence for some people without also being a joke and an embarrassment to others. You just can't, because there's no such thing as a lack of adversary. It doesn't exist. The old saying goes that no matter where you go, there you are. Well, the same is true for adversary and failure. No matter where you go, there's a 500-pound load of shit waiting for you. And that's perfectly fine. The point isn't to get away from the shit. The point is to find the shit you enjoy dealing with. Subtlety number two. To not give a fuck about adversary, you must first give a fuck about something more important than adversary. Imagine you're at a grocery store and you watch an elderly lady scream at the cashier, berating him for not accepting her 30 cent coupon. Why does this lady give a fuck? It's just 30 cents. I'll tell you why. That lady probably doesn't have anything better to do with her days than to sit at home cutting out coupons. She's old and lonely. Her kids are dickheads and never visit. She hasn't had sex in over 30 years. She can't fart without extreme lower back pain. Her pension is on its last legs, and she's probably going to die in a diaper thinking she's in Candyland. So she snips coupons. That's all she's got. It's her and her damn coupons. It's all she can give a fuck about because there is nothing else to give a fuck about. And so when that pimply-faced 17-year-old cashier refuses to accept one of them, when he defends his cash register's purity the way knights used to defend maidens' virginity, 
You can bet Granny is going to erupt. Eighty years of fucks will rain down all at once like fiery hailstorm of back in my day and people used to show more respect stories. The problem with people who hand out fucks like ice cream at a goddamn summer camp is that they don't have anything more fuck-worthy to dedicate their fucks to. If you find yourself consistently giving too many fucks about trivial shit that bothers you, your ex-boyfriend's new Facebook pictures, how quickly the batteries die in the TV remote, missing out on yet another two-for-one sale on hand sanitizer, chances are you don't have much going on in your life to give a legitimate fuck about. And that's your real problem. Not the hand sanitizer, not the TV remote. I once had an artist say that when a person has no problems, the mind automatically finds a way to invent some. I think what most people, especially educated, pampered, middle-class white people, consider life problems are really just side effects of not having anything more important to worry about. It then follows that finding something important and meaningful in your life is perhaps the most productive use of your time and energy, because if you don't find that meaningful something, your fucks will be given to meaningless and frivolous causes. Subtlety number three. Whether you realize it or not, you are always choosing what to give a fuck about. People aren't just born not giving a fuck. In fact, we're born giving way too many fucks. Ever watch a kid cry his eyes out because his hat is the wrong shade of blue? Exactly. Fuck that kid. When we're young, everything is new and exciting, and everything seems to matter so much. Therefore, we give tons of fucks. We give a fuck about everything and everyone. About what people are saying about us, about whether that cute boy girl called us back or not, about whether our socks match or not, or what color our birthday balloon is. As we get older, with the benefit of experience and having seen so much time slip by, we begin to notice that most of these sorts of things have little lasting impact on our lives. Those people whose opinions we cared about so much before are no longer present in our lives. Rejections that were painful in the moment have actually worked out for the best. We realize how little attention people pay to the superficial details about us, and we chose not to obsess so much over them. Essentially, we become more selective about the fucks we're willing to give. This is something called maturity. It's nice. You should try it sometime. Maturity is what happens when one learns to only give a fuck about what's truly fuckworthy. As Bunk Moreland said to his partner, Detective McNulty in The Wire, which, fuck you, I still downloaded, that's what you get for giving a fuck when it wasn't your turn to give a fuck. Oh, my foot's asleep. Then, as we grow older and enter middle age, something else begins to change. Our energy level drops, our identity solidifies, we know who we are, and we accept ourselves, including some of the parts we aren't thrilled about. And, in a strange way, this is liberating. We no longer need to give a fuck about everything. Life is just what it is. We accept it, warts and all. We realize that we're never going to cure cancer, or go to the moon, or feel Jennifer Aniston's tits. And that's okay. Life goes on. We now reserve our ever-dwindling fucks for the most truly fuck-worthy parts of our lives. Our families, our best friends, our golf swing. And to our astonishment, this is enough. This simplification actually makes us really fucking happy. On a consistent basis. And we start to think, maybe that crazy alcoholic Bukowski was onto something. Don't try. So, Mark, what the fuck is the point of this book anyway? This book will help you think a little bit more clearly about what you're choosing to find important in life and what you're choosing to find unimportant. I believe that today we're facing a psychological epidemic, one in which people no longer realize it's okay for things to suck sometimes. I know that sounds intellectually lazy. I know that sounds intellectually lazy on the surface, but I promise you, it's a life-death sort of issue. Because when we believe that it's not okay for things to suck sometimes, then we unconsciously start blaming ourselves. We start to feel as though something is inherently wrong with us, which drives us to all sorts of overcompensation, like buying 40 pairs of shoes, or downing Xanax with a vodka chaser on a Tuesday night, or shooting up a school bus full of kids. This belief that it's not okay to be inadequate sometimes is the source of the growing feedback loop from hell that is coming to dominate our culture. 
The idea of not giving a fuck is a simple way of reorienting our expectations for life and choosing what is important and what is not. Developing this ability leads to something I like to think of as a kind of practical enlightenment. No, not that airy-fairy, eternal bliss, end-of-all-suffering, bullshitty kind of enlightenment. On the contrary, I see practical enlightenment as becoming comfortable with the idea that some suffering is always inevitable. That no matter what you do, life is compromised of failures, loss, regrets, and even death. Because once you become comfortable with all the shit that life throws at you, and it will throw a lot of shit, trust me, you become invincible in a sort of low-level spiritual way. After all, the only way to overcome pain is to first learn how to bear it. This book doesn't give a fuck about alleviating your problems or your pain. And this is precisely why you will know it's being honest. This book is not some guide to greatness. It couldn't be. Because greatness is merely an illusion in our minds, a made-up destination that we obligate ourselves to pursue. Our own psychological Atlantis. Instead, this book will turn your pain into a tool, your trauma into power, and your problems into slightly better problems. That is real progress. Think of it as a guide to suffering and how to do it better, more meaningfully, with more compassion and more humility. It's a book about moving lightly despite your heavy burdens, resting easier with your greatest fears, laughing at your tears as you cry them. This book will not teach you how to gain or achieve, but rather how to lose and let go. It will teach you to take inventory of your life and scrub out all but the most important items. It will teach you to close your eyes and trust that you can fall backwards and still be okay. It will teach you to give fewer fucks. It will teach you not to try. And that, my friends, is the end of chapter one. Next time we read this book... We'll be reading chapter two, Happiness is a Problem. I'm assuming that would be because the polar opposite is sadness. So if we didn't have happiness, we wouldn't have sadness. I don't know. Probably because happiness is not a state of homeostasis. So that kind of fucks you. So, sorry about the language in this book if you're somebody who does not like stuff like that. I know my little cousin does not enjoy things like that at all. Um, so I apologize. I'm going to put that in the title, um, Explicit Language, just so people know. And I'm sure that these books will never be monetized. But I don't think that I'm allowed to monetize um, reading someone else's books anyway. So it don't matter. Look how well our good news is coming. It's good, it's good. All right, thank you so much, friends, for letting me read to you. If you're not already subscribed, please do that. If you want to help think of a name for our little community here, little family, put suggestions in the comments. You can also put suggestions of the day and or time that you think would be good to be our scheduled upload day. I upload once a week and then twice a week when I feel like it. So, yeah, I'll ring the bell because right now I don't have an upload schedule. And do me a favor and smash that thumbs up button so that the algorithm will deem my video worthy to pass on to some other people so much guys love you so much see you next time i'll probably put a shakespeare video up don't worry that's not gonna count as of one of you guys videos thanks so much guys bye